So my talk is about the present and future of um, modeling of airborne virus transmission. Uh, and my objective is um, to present the recent work we have done over the past uh, 12 plus months uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic uh, started and also to highlight some of the challenges that the modern simulation community faces and how the modern simulation in general can provide useful information to the authorities, to the medical practitioners, uh, because this pandemic may be over in, in, some, uh, in the foreseeable future, but uh, we don't know whether we will have another pandemic. And in general, airborne virus transmission is a, is a very important area of uh, uh, research and, uh, uh, and uh, there are a lot of things that we don't know. So the outline very briefly is um, I will, I'm going to present how fluid dynamics can assist virology and epidemiology. Uh, I will talk about the airborne transmission to humans, face masks, weather effects, uh, the effects of uh, virus transmission in confined spaces, and also I will highlight some uh, through discussion uh, and throughout the presentation, some of the items that we have to uh, consider in future research. Um, so let, let's look at some of the facts first regarding the airborne transmission. We know that the infected patients can produce virus bearing droplets by sneezing and coughing. And we know that these droplets will be transmitted to some distance. And I will come back to this in the next few slides. And we also know that the most respiratory droplets are carried forward with moist, uh, warm, turbulent cloud of gas. And uh, we um, know also that uh, air sampling technologies, uh, which are used to detect the presence of viruses and determine distribution of aerosol particles, have many limitations and are not accurate enough. For example, the collection efficiencies are very poor when we use this technology. So this is a motivation for uh, multi-phase and multi-physics simulations to provide uh, additional information or new information and advance the understanding of the transfer of airborne particles to humans. And we see here schematically on the right how the uh, transport of uh, saliva droplets, uh, which uh, are the carriers of the virus, um, um, go forward uh, after the uh, human subject exhaling actually these, these droplets to the environment. Now, uh, we have done a number of studies during the past 12 months, and I will take you through the studies one by one and highlight the uh, key findings. The first thing we did back in March uh, 2020 was that um, we um, raised the question why the two meter distance is, is, is uh, the correct uh, distance that the, uh, for social distancing that the authorities actually uh, uh, put forward and gave us advice to follow. And in fact, uh, this two meter distance goes back to the 30s when there was an epidemiology study at Harvard University. And uh, the study found that when you are in a confined space, uh, the two meter suffices for the uh, droplets actually to um, be carried forward by a human who uh, sneezes or uh, uh, coughs. So we questioned this because we knew that when you are in an environment that you have some environmental conditions which are different, the distance can be greater than two meters. So what we did is we modeled the process uh, as accurately as possible by using multi-phase fluid dynamics. I uh, will present a few more details in the next few slides. Uh, we also modeled uh, the mouth um, by taking actually the details of the mouth because this makes a lot of difference how the jet will be exhaled. And also we took a realistic uh, saliva droplets ejection distribution uh, based on some medical data that uh, were available in, in the literature. So we model using computational fluid dynamics and, and uh, multi-phase computational fluid dynamics, the aerosol process through a realistic uh, mouth um, um, uh, footprint. Um, we used uh, adaptive mesh refinement in order to capture all the details near the mouth in a way. Uh, and here we see a snapshot actually of the particles actually exhaling from the mouth. Uh, and uh, the other thing we realized that uh, when you model um, the particles, uh, droplets in general that um, uh, in, in any process, engineering or biomedical, the uh, conventional wisdom was that uh, the process is steady state. So everybody used uh, the 
steady state runs Mars law for the heat transfer and a, a similar law for the mass transfer. So we, of course, this is not correct. And we demonstrated through a number of publications that there is a significant impact, uh, adverse impact on the results when we use steady state formulas for this kind of um, a, a problem process. So we developed a new formulas that we see here a, a summary of the Nusselt number for the unsteady heat transfer and the Sherwood number for the unsteady mass transfer. And these formulas were developed through a number of simulations uh, that uh, concerned uh, saliva droplets that were carriers of the virus. And we model or mimic to the modeling of uh, COVID-19 virus through some thermodynamic properties. So there's a lot of work that you can find in the relevant papers. Um, all of them, there is. there are five papers we published in the physics of fluids. Um, so all the information is there. Simply I give you a very uh, brief summary of, of the key points here. So uh, we tested first the assumption of the two meter social distancing using these models. And indeed, we found that uh, when you have no wind conditions, no, no, no circulation of the flow, the two meter distance suffices. In fact, can be even less than two meters distance uh, for the distribution of patterns we use, which was a realistic one because we took it from medical experiments. Uh, but what happens is uh, the distance does not, is not sufficient if we increase, uh, the, if we change the environmental conditions and we have a light breeze, let's say uh, four kilometers per hour, or even a stronger wind of 15 kilometers per hour. So this distance can be uh, up to six meters and beyond. And we see here the cloud, how it travels uh, from um, the subject uh, away from left to right. And of course, uh, individuals will be, who are in the vicinity of the subject will be subjected to, to this cloud of droplets. So the two meters doesn't suffice. So um, then we carried out uh, another study for the face mask. Then this was back also in uh, April, May 2020, we started the study uh, where we, uh, there was a lot of discussion about face masks and there is still discussion about face masks. And there are some myths about face masks as well, that the face mask uh, protect us. And uh, uh, is a, some people believe that it is a panacea actually, that uh, if we use face masks, we're not going actually to be affected by droplets and by the virus. Now, in terms of uh, modeling and simulation, there's very little information in the literature. In terms of modeling and simulation, the first thing that uh, we should consider is that uh, the process of uh, uh, coughing and sneezing is, 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 is a continued process, it's not in one-off. So we have to take into account these uh, um, uh, cycling events that happen, happen during this process. So. Um, what we try to do is to model the cycling events by having a realistic, uh, based on some uh, medical evidence uh, that existed uh, from patients, uh, uh, we took the frequencies and the velocity and we try to model it as realistically as possible and have repeated cycles uh, during this process and, and, and try to model the cycles computationally. So we model a phase, uh, again, using uh, multi-phase and uh, unsteady heat transfer and uh, 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 the adaptive mass refinement to capture all the details of the phase. And then we uh, model a mask, which is a surgical mask. I mean, the objective here was not to look at um, the performance of different masks, but to look at, at, at the effects of the mask in general and try to give some advice about uh, whether or not the masks uh, will offer full protection. So we model several processes uh, for the filter, uh, like stick, splash, rebound, penetrate, uh, processes that were not uh, uh, previously modeled uh, for uh, masks materials. Um, and we simulated the flow um, uh, through the mask and around the human at some distance. And we look at the dispersion of the particles there's a lot of modeling work that I don't have time to present here, so I will stick just to the results. Um, we looked at the dispersion of the particles uh, with uh, and without mask at different time instants. And we looked at the streamwise dispersion and the lateral dispersion. Now you can see it's obvious that the mask definitely protects because it reduces the uh, distance um, at which the particles, the droplets will travel 
uh, we see here that with a mask after uh, uh, three seconds, uh, the distance will be about 35 centimeters, where without a mask will go up to uh, 70 centimeters. Uh, so without a mask can go up to um, one and a half, two meters, uh, where with the mask, uh, it will be reduced within a range of 35 to 70 centimeters. And there is quite significant lateral dispersion. This is the other thing, because the mask will not fully protect you. This dispersion of particles will uh, take place uh, 360 degrees, you have buoyancy effects as well as we saw in the previous slide here, you have buoyancy effects that will take the droplets actually upwards uh, as well as to the lateral directions. Now, the other thing, however, that is very important has been uh, ignored uh, by the authorities is that uh, face masks have a certain efficiency. Uh, so there is not proper advice, in my opinion, from uh, um, government authorities and, and practitioners regarding face masks. So if you take the cumulative effect of droplets uh, over a period of time, over a number of cycles, then we will see that the filter efficiency significantly degrades. And we try to model this and produce a model for a surgical mask, which showed that the efficiency of the mask can reduce from 95%, which is the manufacturer's given efficiency, to something uh, like, like uh, 80 percent, 80 plus percent uh, after a number of cycles, after 10 cycles specifically. So imagine that this mask may be worn several uh, hours uh, during the day, so the efficiency will continue to degrade and therefore uh, will make the mask very inefficient. The most important thing is that people will think that the mask still offers some protection. They will relax the social distancing as a result of this um, uh, the transmission will continue to occur. So we put forward several recommendations. I have summarized here only eight out of the many we produced. Uh, the first was that without the wind speed, the droplets will fall to the ground in a short distance. So the recommendation of the meters is still valid. At wind speeds from four kilometers per hour to 15 kilometers per hour, uh, the saliva droplets can travel to distance up to six meters. And depending on the environmental conditions, the two meters social distance will not suffice. So four uh, kilometers per hour to 15 kilometers per hour, we have to be very careful in terms of, of, of the distance the droplets travel. Um, so the droplets will affect uh, uh, adults and children. I mean, it was very interesting that the cloud due to gravity will go towards the trajectory of the ground. So if you have a child actually at a distance of three to five meters away from the subject, uh, uh, is at high risk. Um, so in terms of the face mask, the, the use of face masks will not provide complete prevention, as I mentioned. Uh, the mask will reduce the droplet transmission, uh, uh, but still we have several droplets that will be transmitted away from the mask. And most importantly, uh, we have to uh, be aware that uh, the efficiency of the mask will degrade uh, over the different cycles of the uh, uh, droplets from uh, exhaled uh, from the subject. And uh, we need to address this by setting up criteria and inform the public uh, about the efficiency of the masks. Certainly, if we're talking about medical professionals who are working in a high load environment, uh, complete PPE will be required, the personal protection equipment, if we want to ensure that uh, the uh, medical practitioners are absolutely safe. Now, the other thing that uh, we try to address is uh, environmental effects. We know from experience uh, over uh, centuries, actually, that when we have um, uh, weather conditions that are adverse, then uh, the influence will um, uh, become uh, the transmission stronger, and we know that we have to have higher protection. So there is a peak always when there is uh, bad weather. But the question is, what is the weather condition that facilitates actually the transmission, the survival of the virus? And many people say is the temperature that facilitates the reduction of the virus. If you have higher temperature, you will have reduced virus transmission. Indeed, this is the case. We also found that higher temperature will lead to reduced transmission. But the question is, what is the combined effect of relative humidity with the temperature? And what we found is that there is a combination of parameters that we need to look at is the wind, is the temperature, and is the relative humidity as well. And if we look at the results on the right here, 
you will see the number of droplets uh, versus time at different relative humidities and different temperatures. We see that only when we have low relative humidity and high temperature, this combined effect will drastically reduce the, uh, the droplets transmission. Effectively, what happens is everything is linked to evaporation. So the evaporation is stronger and greater when we have uh, lower, uh, lower relative humidity and higher temperature. So this is the important effect. And of course, this affects how the cloud will be transmitted away from the subject as well. We further uh, carried on studies uh, to look at these effects in confined spaces. Uh, there is another myth there that um, if you have ventilation, the ventilation, still many people actually on the radio this morning said that if you ventilate enough, uh, this will be sufficient, which is a myth because the ventilation will induce circulation of the flow. So depending on the um, size of the space and depending on the conditions of the ventilation, we may actually have uh, worsen the effect of the transmission rather than uh, reducing the effect of the transmission. Um, so we looked at different conditions and I will present two results here. It's a confined space, a, a lift or an elevator uh, for some. Um, and uh, we use different inlets and outlets and we looked at uh, the effect of uh, air purifiers on the circulation. So we found that we, when we have less ventilation, less inlets of ventilation, then the droplets, of course, will circulate less because we have less um, uh, inflow velocities that uh, restrict the circulation. We see here for a, a particular setup how the droplets circulate within the space um, when a, a human uh, exhales these droplets. And then we looked at the uh, effect of the air purifier and we found that the placement of ventilation inlets at outlets will influence the flow circulation and dispersion. And that without an air purifier, um, the best results is for uh, the case of a single in inlet and outlet. Okay, this, this will result in, the, in, in minimizing the droplet dispersion. Um, the position, of course, of the subject inside the cabin, if you have a lift, uh, will, will play an important role. If you have more than one subject, of course, the, the problem becomes uh, worse. Um, the air purifier, however, will not uh, eliminate completely the droplet dispersion. Even air purifiers that have the UV light will not completely eliminate the virus. And it is very important that uh, we take this into account when we design the air intake, which is integrated inside the purifier equipment, because this can induce flow circulation that can um, uh, add to the transport of contaminated saliva droplets in the cabin. So um, then the other area we try to address is to see whether we can improve the epidemiological model. And what we found is that uh, 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 we have the, the, the basic epidemiological model, the SIR model, uh, which is used by all epidemiologists. And this model is um, uh, augmented with different uh, inputs, uh, different conditions. It's, it's essentially a manual process. Uh, but all these models don't take into account the weather effects. Uh, so this is, this is uh, in my opinion, uh, incorrect. Uh, we have to, uh, and we have demonstrated that the seasonality and the effects of the weather play a very important role. And uh, therefore, we uh, took a very basic model, SIR model, uh, the, the, the foundation of, or, uh, of the SIR model. And then we introduced uh, the seasonality effects through weather data and the predictions we made for the virus transmission as function of the relative humidity, um, uh, temperature, and, and wind, and establish a connection between uh, fluid dynamics and epidemiology. And here we see how the concentration rate uh, against the temperature for relative for different relative humidities and, and uh, wind speeds causes actually uh, an envelope within which the data of the concentration uh, fall and, and, and this envelope actually is something that we need to take into account if we want to define when the virus will be in a strong state uh, or in a weak state uh, depending on the weather conditions. 
So uh, in, in, in brief, uh, what we did is the SIR, SIR model that uh, has a coefficient that is called airborne infection rate. We link this airborne infection rate AIR to the concentration rate. We said that the infection rate should be proportional or linked directly to the concentration rate. And we calculate the concentration rates for different uh, environmental conditions. We developed a model for these conditions for the specific coronavirus, taking into account the thermodynamic properties of the virus. And then we introduce this into the SAR model. And we produce for different uh, transmission rates. We looked at uh, different uh, environmental data um, in March 2020 and August 2020. And uh, um, we um, showed that the AIR provides a direct link between the fluid dynamics, weather predictions, and the spread of the disease as was reported by the authorities. And the results suggested that the, there are two pandemic outbreaks per annum that are uh, more likely to occur as the result of environmental conditions. And um, th this is, in our opinion, an important outcome because, uh, and, and we saw actually by demonstrating for different cities uh, Paris, New York, uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, how the weather conditions, the transmission rates, and the number of cases are linked. Uh, bear in mind that we don't do here any modeling by correcting the data as other epidemiological uh, reports uh, produce based on the most recent data. So what we did here, we took the initial condition uh, of March 2020, introduced uh, the uh, data at that point, and then we made predictions to see if there will be a second outbreak and when it is more likely this outbreak to take place. And we found actually uh, uh, very interestingly that this outbreak will take place around the time that it took take place uh, over the past uh, few months. So here the objective was not to predict specifically the number of cases, which is Im impossible to do, uh, because you cannot trace all the population, but to find out when, based on the weather conditions and the basic SIR model, uh, you have a higher likelihood to have uh, a second or a third or a, a subsequent more outbreaks. And I think this is something that uh, will benefit epidemiological models, which of course can be much more complicated than the very simple uh, model we use here. So by introducing the weather conditions, we can have uh, much better predictions and longer term predictions, which may question actually the strict lockdowns um, that uh, have been imposed in different countries, because if we know that in uh, a few weeks time, based on weather data and predictions and weather forecast, uh, uh, the weather may be adverse, uh, then we can uh, properly plan. So I, I think I will stop here. I have a movie. I don't know if uh, the movie uh, will be uh, able to uh, run, but uh, I can stop um, here and take any, uh, this is uh, from the masks to show the dispersion of the particles, stop here and take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you.